Welcome to the Seed Family Podcast, where we explore natural, homeschooling, gentle parenting, simple living, and family adventure. I'm Rachel Rainbolt, the Sage Parenting Coach, coming to you from the Pacific Northwest, where I live wild and free in connection with my three wildlings and the papa bear in our fixer-upper on the beach. This is episode 43, and today I'm here with Shira Gill talking about organization. Shira is the founder of Shira Gill Home, a lifestyle brand focused on clutter-free living that merges minimalism, organization, and style. She is passionate about helping busy women reclaim their style and learn how to live a well-edited life filled with fewer, better things. So join us around the campfire and let's get living the family life of our dreams. Skylar90 says, Sage Family is amazing. Seriously, my favorite podcast I've ever listened to. I've learned so much about gentle parenting, minimalism, and simplicity, and just connecting and making this stage joyful. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Skylar, for leaving such a nice review. And you too can support the show using the currency of feedback by scrolling down in the Apple Podcast app and clicking write a review. Click those stars, say you love the show, and you help spread these messages of gentle parenting, natural homeschooling, and simple living. The adventure I'm sharing this week was a lovely hike along a creek to the beach with friends. It's such a commonplace activity for us that I normally wouldn't feature it in the podcast, but it feels profound from where I stand now. A gaggle of kids running around together, climbing and splashing and giggling, and parents strolling and chatting and laughing. My favorite thing that I really noticed and absorbed that day was the way the kids all helped each other worked together to literally boost and lift each other up to reach higher heights, crossing fallen logs over running water, climbing enormous tree stumps, scaling steep hillsides, hand in hand, foot in in hand, foot on back, whatever was needed. Again, profound in ways I couldn't have anticipated. Now, when I step barefoot out into my backyard and look out at the birds soaring over the sound, the world feels the same, yet our life feels so different. We haven't left our property or played with friends in a week, and our extroverted hearts are already aching. I know that technically we are homeschoolers, but that term never resonated with me because we weren't doing school at home. We were living a rich, full life out in the world. Even for us, this is hard. Social distancing is hard. Sheltering in place is hard. Living in a pandemic is hard. I want to acknowledge that before I go on to extend any invitations. Since I won't be out adventuring with hack school or traveling with my family for the foreseeable future, I'm going to use this segment to share insights that might be helpful for you in this hard time, starting with an invitation to resist the urge to fill in all the space that closed schools, programs, and workplaces have created, particularly all the unintentional homeschoolers who are clamoring for academic busy work and panicked about their kids just doing nothing. Have you ever met a kid? (laughs) They are never doing nothing. What you're really doing is passing judgment on their interests. Now, stick with me here. Instead of frantically trying to fill in all the space that school closures have created, hold that space and get to know your kids better. Let them get to know themselves better. Observe them, get curious and wonder what is happening behind their eyes while they're engaging in various freely chosen and unstructured activities. Notice what makes them special. 
Yes, even if you are working from home like I do, you don't need to keep them busy. Let them be. Just be together in shared space. Read books, watch shows, play games, take walks, cook meals, share conversations. That's not nothing. That's real life. And that's actually where all the meaningful learning takes place. My eight-year-old Wes designed and constructed his own zip line across our yard yesterday. Math, science, engineering, PE. It was pretty rad and, quite frankly, pretty normal around here. I'm not so secretly hoping for a revolution once you all taste the freedom and joy. Now, this conversation you're about to hear is well-timed because decluttering and organizing is something I highly recommend doing right now. It feels very therapeutic to take control of a space that is yours and create order out of chaos. And since we're in our homes all day right now, it's even more imperative to feel good in them. Though I also wanted to be sure you know that we recorded this episode before the coronavirus. So the carefree tone might feel off, but the conversation has value, even more so now. Now, if you want to see photos and videos of this adventure or the organizing I do in my home, then head on over to sage.family on Instagram and follow along. And notice my Instagram handle has changed from Sage Parenting to sage.family at your suggestion. So thank you for that. And I look forward to carrying on these conversations with you over on the gram. Today, Shira Gill is joining me to share a conversation on organization. I found Shira on Instagram forever ago and in a sea of organizers that just put all the shit you don't need in plastic boxes or minimalists who miss the cozy style that is essential for me or experts who completely ignore the deeper work that underlies the meaningful identity work of curating your environment. She is the only one who really speaks to my simple earthy therapist organizer soul. (laughs) So tell us Tell everyone your story, Shira. Who are you? What are you all about? Okay, thank you. Well, thanks so much for having me, and I that was such a lovely introduction. (laughs) Uh, So thanks. Um, So yeah, I I've been trying to figure out the right job title um, for what I do for ten years, and I've kind of given up. But I think (laughs) it's sort of like a hybrid between if a home organizer and a life coach and a minimalist and a stylist had a baby. Um, That is what my business is. Yes, I love that. (laughs) So um, I am a certified um, life coach through the life coach school. And um, so those skills are kind of in my toolkit that I bring to home organizing. Um, And I also, I guess, self-identify as a minimalist or aspiring minimalist. And so I infuse those principles in my work. Um, and I've always loved, um, style both in terms of, um, you know, clothes and shoes and all the pretty things and also interiors and decor. Um, so that's kind of an interesting part of my career, balancing my love of minimalism and, and having less with my love of all the pretty things. (laughs) Um, and so, I've, I've basically created a business where I help other women, um, primarily, um, who are juggling busy lives and all the things and all the clutter, um, both physically and mentally that comes with being alive on the planet. (laughs) And, um, I take people through a process of really clarifying, um, what their bigger, deeper goals and values are. And then stripping away all of the um, physical clutter in their home that often leads to mental clutter um, and stress and anxiety and paralysis and all of those things. So um, I really think of my job as like I help people achieve their bigger goals through the process of organizing their homes. Yes, I love that. (laughs) See, guys, that's why I picked her out of all of those (laughs) Those people just putting everything in boxes. 
I know. And that is like one of the biggest organizing mistakes is going out and buying all the containers <laughs> is never going to solve your problem. Yes. Sadly, <laughs> which okay. was a magic container. So uh, let's talk, let's talk about that clutter piece. Um, yeah. I mean, clutter along with things like debt and depression and anxiety is normal in American culture, which makes it easy to accept as a given. But this yeah. community is all about bravely questioning and challenging the mainstream evolutionary mismatch to live a lifestyle in which we can actually thrive. So mm. I want to invite us all to take a critical look at the role of clutter in our homes and our lives. What are some insidious ways that clutter undermines our peace and freedom and joy, Shira? Well, so I think, um, you know, clutter literally is noise and stimulation and mm. distraction, right? So mm -hmm. um, whether that's physical or mental, it's getting in the way of, um, you know, living our best lives, feeling our best. And so when I, you know, look around someone's house, what I, I've been doing this work for 10 years. And so I've realized every single thing we own provide some sort of visual stimulation, you know, whether that's positive or negative. So like a beautiful piece of art or fresh flowers might provide positive stimulation or distraction. Um, stacks of papers or dirty dishes or laundry provides a different type of, um, you know, clutter and distraction. And so I think, you know, quite simply put, like clutter gets in the way of living our best lives and meeting our goals, um, achieving our dreams, it just gets in the way. And so I think what I've realized, you know, working in hundreds of homes, and I've also lived in many homes, I was the child of divorce and went back and forth, back and forth um, between my two parents' homes almost every other day, um, and then moved a lot. Um, I used to be an actor before I started this career. And so I've actually lived in more than 25 different homes. And what I found is after packing up and packing and unpacking and settling into all of these different spaces, um, what I started figuring out is like all of this stuff was really weighing me down and getting in the way. And so my question became like, how do we figure out the right amount for us, like the perfect amount to serve our lives and make our lives easier, better, more efficient. And how do we cut all of that clutter that's just getting in the way and weighing us down and distracting us? Um, and so it's a question that everyone will have a different answer. Like there is no magic number or quantity. Um, People ask me all the time, you know, like, well, what is the right amount of shoes <laughs> to own, you know? And I'm like, well, I can tell you the right amount for me mm -hmm. that I figured out or the right amount for our family that we figured out. But it all comes down to your values. Like, what do you care about? What do you want to make space for? What are the things you want to do? And then looking at, well, what's standing in the way of that? And so what I've realized through my work is, the more you can let go of in your home in terms of just quantity and sheer volume, the less you have to manage, the less you have to clean, the less you have to organize. Um, like stuff is a responsibility. And so I think in a world where there's so much noise and there's so much clamoring for our attention, I realize like this is a way where we do have some control. We get to be the gatekeepers of our homes and we get to decide what is the amount that I want to surround myself with and what needs to hit the road and get out of my way? Yes. Your external environment is a reflection of your internal state and vice versa. Your internal state is a reflection of your external environment. And that's something important to keep in mind. If you feel internal chaos and overwhelm, simplifying and ordering your external environment does the same for your internal state. And it's so important to understand that children reflect their environment back as behavior. Dumping mm. is a great example. If your child dumps all the toys onto the floor as soon as they <laughs> walk into the room, you have way too many toys in the space. So if right. you're experiencing a problematic behavior on repeat while in your home, the first thing to look at is the environment. Yeah. And I mean, I think, you know, I'm a mother of two and I think, you know, there's no question there's so much 
clutter that comes with children, right? Mm -hmm. Like the gear and the presents and the birthday parties and all of the things. And so I do think just as a teacher kind of sets the boundaries and the guidelines in a classroom, we have to figure out what those boundaries are in our own home um, in terms of like how many toys are out on offer for our kids to manage and for us to manage. Uh And so I think for me, I realize even though there's so much noise and there's so much pressure to buy all the latest gizmos and gadgets and, you know, the latest toys that I found for me, I just don't want to manage all of it. And I don't want my kids to have to manage all of it. So even if sometimes they're annoyed at me that I won't buy them something, I feel like I can really own the choices that I've made around it and feel like I like my reasons for giving them less stuff. Yeah, I think you, when you said the word values, that's something that we talk a lot about on this podcast, that your values are your compass. And Mm -hmm. that's true even in this conversation and even on the parenting side with kids. You know, if my kid asks for a toy, I don't just say no, or I don't just say we can't afford it, or I I don't say anything like that. We have a values conversation. We check in about it. We say, okay, well, what would that look like? What would that mean for us to add this to our home like where would it live mm-hmm. how would it add value for us what what would we be saying no to if we said yes to this thing um we were going to go roller skating you know on thursday with your friends like this would cost about the same that that will cost so do you want to do that buy this instead of do that so having these like values based conversations and talking about how you're using the space now and if we fill it with this object like you're not going to have enough room to play and sort of like inviting them in to the things that we consider when we make all of these decisions is helpful yeah. I love that. And I definitely involve my kids a lot in terms of giving them a choice within the constraints Mm -hmm. um, that I provided. So saying like, you know, right now, say there's, we have 10 puzzles and our puzzle shelf is full. If you want a new puzzle, you get to pick one of the puzzles to donate to charity. Yes. Um, And so I'm not going to pick that for them, but I'm going to kind of set that bigger boundary. Mm -hmm. And I think when parents are really clear and they really own those choices, the kids get it. Absolutely. When there's not the wavering or the ambivalence or the guilt, but it's really like, this is how we do it. You can do this or this. Kids are like, okay, I'm game. But I do feel like they can sniff out, you know, I have many clients (laughs) who have not like fully owned it and they want to, but they're like, what do you think? And I'm like, no, that's the kiss of death. So, <laughs> yes, to be to be like the role model. And right. also, if you have had a hard time figuring this out for yourself, in a lot of ways, we can heal through our parenting. And this is one of them. Like when yeah. I'm talking this through out loud with my kids, it it helps me too. like it reinforces that thought process that I want to be able to move through with my own purchases as well. And oh, that yeah. space boundary thing is something that you mentioned that I love and I talk a lot about with families. Um, because I'm not sure how familiar you are with this podcast, but we talk about like gentle parenting and unschooling and it's Uh a very like respectful, collaborative, um, dynamic that we have with our children and relationship and decision-making sort of runs through that filter. Um, and so space boundaries are something that I have found where we make agreements in collaboration with the kids. So how many... Like, which size box do we want to have for all of our Legos? Like, where do we want the box to live? Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about, like, if you have more, it's harder to find the pieces. Like, what sort of setup works well for you? We do all that in collaboration. And then we adhere, like, we make an agreement and we adhere to that space boundary. So, like, we just um, built this really cool, um, like, daybed sectional Um, that we use for our sofa in our great room. And there's like an under the bed box underneath that houses all of their Legos. And then the coffee table is their Lego table. So all of their creations, all the ongoing projects that they work on have to fit on the coffee table. And as long as they are on the coffee table, I don't mess with them. I don't move them. I don't tell them to put them away. I don't tell them to clean it up. And as long as all of the Lego bricks are in that box, as long as they fit in that box, then great. So yesterday, two of the kids came up to me and said that they wanted to order a bunch of these um, Lego bricks that look like actual bricks. 
like building bricks, um, like on a house. And I said, great, like how many do you want to order? You know, and we, we talked through all that. And then I said, and which bricks are going to come out so that there's room for these bricks in the box? Cause you know, all the, right. all the bricks have to fit in the box or the box won't slide under the sofa. So like, which bricks are you going to take out? You know, so you want to buy a hundred new bricks? Like, that's cool. Um, show me the pile of a hundred bricks going out. We can put them in the donation bin and then um, we can order the new bricks. <laughs> I love it. And I think kids really get it, you know, when they get it logical. And I love, you know, that you talked about really involving them in the process. So it's not just like a dictatorship, but Mm -hmm. it's really a collaborative process to figure out what are our family values? Where do we want the limits? Where is there flexibility to make decisions within those limits? I think it's a really good. And I, I mean, kids will call you on stuff too. You know, my, I have two daughters and they've both started saying like, Hey, why do we have two pairs of shoes and you have way more than that? <laughs> and I've explained to them that my feet are done growing, which I think is a pretty good answer. <laughs> but, you know, I certainly have a thing for shoes and own more than they do. And they're looking around and observing all of my choices all the time. So totally. it keeps me really in check. <laughs> so true it's so true and they will hold you because it is like a two-way relationship they will help to hold you accountable too like if you have you know one um shelf for coffee mugs and you're at the store about to buy another one and you're they know that the coffee mug shelf is like overflowing right they're gonna remind you of that like oh yeah (laughs) they will hold you accountable which i love like i think that that's awesome it shows that they really get it like they're internalizing that like decision making and that framework and like how to respectfully support someone you care about in living their values like i love when my kids hold me accountable i think it's the most beautiful thing I love that. My girls are very sassy about it, but I do still appreciate it. <laughs> we are heavy on the snark and sarcasm in my house, so it does often sound a, a far more sarcastic and snarky um, than right. that example that I gave. But yes, the spirit underlying it is kind. <laughs> I'm with you. Yes. Okay, so let's talk about that minimalism piece. A lot of organizers, like I said, just pull all the clutter into labeled plastic boxes, which makes me cringe because organized clutter is still clutter. Putting something you don't need or want in a labeled plastic box does not make it add value to your life. One of the things I love about you and your work is that you get the importance of the minimalism piece, the power of the edit, of less, of mindful curation, the letting go. Why is minimalism a core value in your work? Well, I think, you know, minimalism has benefited my life in so many ways. And so number one, I'm really, I'm teaching it because it's a principle that I believe in and that um, has really informed so much of how I live my life. And what I love about minimalism is that I think it truly is a philosophy that's about determining your values and living your values um, as opposed to, like, I think minimalism gets a bad wrap. Um, I think a lot of people assume that it's about deprivation and scarcity and, you know, stark white rooms with nothing. (laughs) And for me, minimalism is really a process that you go through to determine what adds value in your life and what's just cluttering up and taking up space in your life. So that's why I love it so much is because I think it kind of calls on us to ask those bigger, deeper questions and, um, and really think about our present and our past and our future and how we want to live, what we want to model to our kids, all of that. Um, and then the other reason is just because, you know, as you mentioned, um, I think there are many, many organizers that take the container store by storm (laughs) for (laughs) asking those questions and digging a little deeper. Um, And I think, you know, I feel like I owe it to my clients and my industry to really model something different, which is leading with the edit, leading with that, you know, mindful curation that you mentioned of looking at what have I got, what makes sense, what gets to stay, what needs to go. And then at the very end, like it's almost like the cherry on top 
is that piece of, and now do I need any specific organizing vessels yes. to support my home and kind of bring it to the next level or keep the order? But I think it's like, really, it is like the last piece. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I find, you know, I'm educating my clients on this a lot because often when they hire me, like they look at pictures of beautiful homes and magazines and they're like, I want that. Like, can we go shopping for all the things? <laughs> And I'm always like, slow your roll. Let's (laughs) like really go through the process of seeing, like you don't even know what you've got. Like Mm -hmm. there are treasures hiding in every house. Um, And so what I find is typically like closets are one of my um, favorite places to organize. And what I find more often than not is by the time you go through your closet and you get rid of all the things that are truly gathering dust and getting in your way, it's almost like you've discovered a whole new wardrobe Yes. without buying a thing. And I hear that all the time from my clients and even simple things like, you know, typically when I do a closet edit with a client, we're getting rid of 30 to 50% of what they own. So at the end of that, there's all of this space, which feels really good to most people. Mm -hmm. There's like space between hangers. You can see what you've got. All your favorites are now easy to find on display. And then often I'll find like, oh, you actually have enough matching hangers now where we don't need to buy any additional hangers to have the like, you know, curated look of uniform hangers. Whereas if we had shopped before, we would have just bought all of this stuff that you actually don't need. Mm -hmm. So I'm all about the edit. And I think, you know, in my process, um, you know, I teach a five step process of organizing anything. I think the editing step is really like 90% yes. of getting the results that you want. Um, and I, and what I love about it too, is that it's free, like yes. edit. it's accessible to anybody. Nobody has to pay for it. Nobody has to buy anything new or stretch themselves other than I guess, mentally the stretch of kind of cultivating that clarity and that abundant mindset. And, um, I talk a lot about radical generosity um, and I love the idea of like just last week, here's an example. I had a dear friend going through a divorce who's starting over in a new home. She has kids and she's kind of starting from scratch. And I had this beautiful light fixture that, you know, we had paid $400 for and we weren't using it anymore. We didn't have a place in our home. I had intended on selling it, but I thought about my friend and how good it would feel to just give her this um, and not ask for money, not ask for anything in return, but just that it would feel so good to offer something that I had that I didn't. And she was so delighted and like brought it home and it helped make her feel like, you know, she was turning her apartment into more of a home. Hmm. And um, at the end of the day, like, yes, I could have like hustled and sold it and recovered some money, but to me, it felt so much better to just give. Um, and, and so I think that's something I really like to, um, to stress in this work is that there is an opportunity instead of beating yourself up for like, Oh, what a waste. Or I spent money on this and I'm not using it. Right. Like, guess what? You can give it to someone and totally make their day. And it's a win-win. Like you get it out of your house they get something awesome that maybe they wouldn't have bought or couldn't afford. Everybody wins. Yeah. I love like the sharing economy. Like that does that for me. Like I have a local buy nothing group or a group of friends where we move stuff through Mm -hmm. the group, like toys and kids clothes and whatnot. And yeah, like your sunk costs, like you already paid the price. Like you don't need to continue paying it. Um, it feels good definitely to let it go. You know, there's this, there's this concept called unpacking your baggage that I have been talking about forever. Like since I started mm-hmm. my career a million years ago. And, um, it's funny cause this was like before I had ever heard the word minimalism or heard about minimalism, but it was basically that like the first step, um, in any sort of like transformation or growth is unpacking the baggage. So you inherit so much crap. There are these like assumptions and expectations and beliefs and things you inherited from your family, things that were normalized through society, whatever. The first step is to unpack all of those. And then when I started moving into like the environment as a a piece of that, 
I found yeah. it to be so powerful in in accessing that deeper, more meaningful work. Like you said, it's free. You can do it in little snippets. You can, uh, it's just this like physical way of accessing this like really powerful identity work. Because as you decide what fits for you and what doesn't, you are deciding who you are and what kind of life you want to live and what kind of person you want to be. Exactly. And I think, you know, when I think about my own editing process, I think before I started even touching anything physically, I really got clear on the things that I wanted to do. Like, what did I want to, what do I want to do in my space? Like, I love having people over. We love hosting and entertaining and having parties. I wanted my house to support that. Um, I love traveling. Um, we love taking road trips. We love traveling internationally. So it was like really thinking about who I am and what I care about and what I want to be able to do. And then realizing a lot of the stuff in my house was standing in the way of that. And mm. once I cleared that away, like I realize now, oh, I have designed the exact life that I wanted through my home. Yes. Now we can like have kids over at the drop of a hat. We can host a party. We can rent our house. I mean, I had to actually reschedule our recording because we rented our house to be <laughs> used for a commercial on Monday. But it's like, to me, that is like living my dream, which I wouldn't be able to do had I not put all of that time into setting my house up to support those values. Yes. What kind of life do you want to hold space for? Even in terms of like habits, like if I want to do yoga every day, I have to have a yoga mat sitting right there then there has to be a space for me to just roll it out. Like if I have to clean up a room first, if I have to go to a closet, I don't do it. Like, right. so, so I can let go of a bunch of stuff that's getting in the way of that habit that I feel really helps me to be my best self and hold space for that thing. It's just, it's, it's really incredible how power that like that physical action, it just how powerful that can be on so many other levels. Yes. And I love, that's one of my favorite questions is just simply, what do you want to create space for? Yes. And I think once you answer that, then it makes it exponentially easier to edit because editing is something that typically is really challenging for people. There's the sunken cost thing. There's like the gifts and guilt thing. Mm -hmm. There's the, what if I use it one day? <laughs> but I think as you mentioned, like even if it's just something simple, like I really want to do yoga every day, then clearing the crap in the corner so yes. they have a lovely little, you know, sun kissed spot to put your yoga mat suddenly makes sense and becomes easy because you have that compelling why. Yes, yes. And I'll share just like a really quick example. I had in my, um, we have this big lower level and um, I had it set up, a, a section of it set up as a guest space for my mom to come and visit, visit. We wanted to hold the space for her to come and visit. And then after she passed away, like one of the first things I did when I, when I got back home um, was to donate, gift the guest bed and the nightstands and, and everything that was there. And I made that my yoga space. So mm -hmm. I, kept, I rolled out the yoga mat. I put a, moved a plant there from a different part of the house, moved my essential oil diffuser there. Like I had a, <laughs> an outlet, like all set up and empty and ready to go for my laptop. Like I, I, I had to, to shift how I used the space and it, it, it felt really, really powerful and helpful. Like I wasn't standing there staring at you know, I wasn't, I, I couldn't like continue to hold the space for her to come and visit and she's not going to come and visit. And it's right. amazing like how, how often people are doing that. Um, and it, and it, it's hurting them and it's undermining who they want to be and the growth that they want to make and the progress that they want to have, um, holding space for things that no longer fit. Yeah, that's so beautifully said. And I think it's, you know, just as there's the question, like, what do you want to create space for? There's also the question, what do you want to let go of? Yes. Like, what yes. are those things that are really holding you back, standing in your way, yeah. impeding your success? And um, I think they work hand in hand. Yeah. So let's talk about those blocks. Like one thing I have found to be powerful in supporting people through that letting go process 
is understanding how your clutter has been protecting you. Um, mm -hmm. Marie Kondo recommends thanking each item and Carrie Richardson has her book, What Your Clutter Is Trying to Tell You. Love both. And my <laughs> therapy background wants to invite you all to lean in a little closer and acknowledge specifically how holding on to this stuff has been protecting you because we can't really be free of it until we acknowledge it. So if like you're feeling blocked, this just helps you to like see things more clearly. Um, for example, perhaps keeping all the toys that your children have outgrown protects you from the transition into a new parenting season. And when we choose one beloved set to keep for future grandchildren, take a few photos to commemorate that season and journal some special memories, like we can move into the new season consciously and with excitement. But if you're just seeing a pile of toys and feeling blocked and saying you don't have time, then you're going to stay stuck. Um, perhaps your deceased mother was a clutter queen and maintaining clutter in your home protects your connection with her. It feels like it keeps her alive in a way. Acknowledging that allows us to consciously speak to that connection and commemorate her best ways of being in other healthier ways. Um, maybe you're going to move as soon as you clean out the garage, but you're secretly afraid of such a big change. In all these examples, the clutter is a symptom. It's an invitation to lean into some discomfort and heal and grow. And just like we want to bring in like a hyacinth storage bin for your cloth napkins, <laughs> we also want to provide a safe container for those deeper things. So what questions do you ask people who feel stuck in that process of letting go? Yeah, well, I think the first thing I want to stress is just having compassion for yourself mm -hmm. if you're feeling stuck or overwhelmed or paralyzed um, and being curious about it instead of critical or judgmental. Yes. Um, and so I think there's a lot of shame wrapped up in this work and a lot of kind of like self judgment and beating ourselves up. And, you know, I work with such accomplished professionals, like literally NASA scientists and brain surgeons mm -hmm. who are so ashamed to show me their house. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I always want to, first of all, approach it just from curiosity Yes. and not from judgment, but just like, Hey, like, let's go easy on ourselves. Like, why is your house the way it is? How did it get there? Let's be really curious about it. Like for some people, it is like a death or a divorce or something traumatic that kind of kept them stuck or paralyzed that they're now ready to move out of. Yeah. Um, for some people, it truthfully is just that they've been so busy you know, organizing other parts of their lives that their house has been neglected. But I always want to stress, like, there's just no upside to being mean to ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like, first of all, let's just go easy. <laughs> yes. Then from there, it's like, okay, wherever we are now, that's just the neutral circumstance. Where do we want to go? And so that's what I'm always really curious about is like, let's spend less time in the past and in the like, how did I get here? Why is this such a mess? Why can't I manage this? And let's get into what do we want to create? Like, what is that compelling vision or that compelling, exciting why? And let that kind of energetically drive the work that needs to be done. Yes, like yeah. radical acceptance, like yes. staying curious and not critical. Like this is where we're where we are and that's yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah, and then I think like really once you have that compelling why or the reason you want things to be different, then it makes it so much easier to kind of cut through the clutter and make those hard decisions because you know, you can then have um something to, to hold it to, right? So if you're just looking at something objectively, anything could be useful, right? Mm -hmm. But if it's like, is this thing going to get me closer to my goals? Or is this thing worth the space it takes up in my home right now? Um, I just think it's about asking better questions. And so I can share some of my favorites. Yeah. Um, you know, like I love asking, would I buy this item for full price today? Mm. Um, I think 
almost always the answer is no. <laughs> um, or like, would I take this with me if I were to pack up and move and start over fresh? Um, I love helping people when they're moving because they're in this mindset of like freedom around, I get to start over. I get to like wipe the slate clean and pick and choose what I'm going to surround myself with moving forward. Mm -hmm. But I think you don't have to be moving. You get to decide right now. Um, and you know, the big one, is this adding value? Like, it's not really a question of, could this be useful? Like anything can be useful, a pen right. can be useful, but like, do you need a thousand pens? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. Um, which leads me to the other thing, you know, getting back to kind of boundaries and volume. I think, you know, when we're kids, we rely on the adults in our lives to help us make decisions and they set boundaries for us. And sometimes it can be really difficult to be an adult and to have to make those boundaries and those rules for yourself. Yeah, especially um, since on the mainstream parenting paradigm, it's not a collaboration. It's like a top-down, enforced, coercive right. um, model. So you are completely disempowered. So then when you become an adult, you kind of want to rebel against that and recapture some of that power and say, I'm going to keep it all. <laughs> totally. And so I think it's like looking at like, well, you could keep it all. That's fine. <laughs> That's what you've but been doing. <laughs> like, is it going to get you where you want to go? And, yes. you know, sometimes people will challenge me and say like, well, I don't want to be like you. I don't want to have like, <laughs> you know, three reusable bags. I want to have 20. And I'm like, that's fine. Like, yes, then 20 is your number as long as you feel good about it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the that's the barometer. Do you like your reasons for having 20 reusable bags? If you feel great about it, there's no problem in my book. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's like questioning volume. And also, you know, from a sustainability perspective, I'm always looking at like, how can we be responsible citizens in the world? And yes. So to me, accumulating, you know, rooms full of plastic is just not being a responsible citizen. Yes. Um, and so I make a lot of choices around those things as well as like, how can I treat the earth as best as I can? How can I honor the people that are making things? How can I treat my own space with respect? And I know that if I have too much stuff, I'm not going to be able to respect my stuff or keep it clean or organized mm -hmm. or manage it. So for me, that helps me a lot in terms of making those decisions and creating those boundaries. Yeah. And I think like those space, that space boundary you mentioned can be helpful because it helps you to get at that essential piece. Like for example, say, okay, you want to have one drawer of reusable bags. Great. Like, so how many is that? Like how many how, choose your favorites to go into the yeah. drawer first and then yeah. stop when the drawer is full but can be opened and closed. Like, And then we'll yes. look at that number and that's your number. Like that's Exactly. And that's such an easy brain hack. Like when yes. people get overwhelmed and they're just sort of like wrestling with a pile to be like, okay, well, let's just pick where this is going to live in your house and what are the physical boundaries. And then we just pick the favorites that will fit. Yes. It feels very like rational and logical with which the brain loves. Yes. And you get that freedom of choice of like, well, I still get to pick my favorites, but it's not limitless. Exactly. And I have like these three questions too that I will often move through with people um, when we focus in on like one space at a time. Um, like for example, the master bathroom, like I might say like, what would you be devastated to have lost? Like say like a flood rolled through and right. washed everything away. The bathroom is completely empty. Uh, what would you be devastated to have lost? Like you would, you would physically cry over it. Uh, right. Like for me, that would be my mom's perfume. Like it's one of the few things that I kept from her, from her house. Yeah. Like she wore it every day. I would be devastated to lose that. What is something that you would need to replace? Like I would need um, to replace my inhaler, like that I keep in the bathroom. Um, I would need to, like I would need a toothbrush, like so that I would, I would have to. And then, what would you want to buy? So, like, what would you? What would I literally go out to the store and buy a new one of? 
Um, right. Like that, and that gets at that question you asked earlier, like, would you go out and spend the money on it today? Like, so I find those three questions to be, to be really helpful in getting people, like, getting that momentum going. It helps to like clarify what I things love really that. Mean. Yeah. And it's, I mean, I'm in Northern California. We've been having, you know, fires and all sorts of natural disasters. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's really, I think, prompted everybody in this community to start asking those questions of like, if we have to pack up on a moment's notice and like, we're literally just getting our precious children out the door, Mm -hmm. what are those things we're grabbing? And when we sat down and talked about it as a family and kind of made a plan, it actually was felt really reassuring to me that the list was pretty short. Like after we have like the the kids and the dog and and the actual like living, breathing things, Mm -hmm. people, there weren't that many things that felt truly not replaceable, like just stuff, like just mugs or couches or, you know, those neutral items like, you know, I lost a parent like you, so I have a few treasures from my dad that really are not anything you could buy at the store. So right. it's like, there's those things, but you can kind of count them on one hand. Exactly. Um, and that felt really, I guess, liberating and freeing to kind of realize that like, oh, there's not that much, like everything else truly is just stuff that you can yes. go buy at the store. Yes. Yes. It's, a, it's, it's really cool how like, just a simple, like you said, like a mind hack, like an exercise to think through, like, okay, fire burned down your house. Like what, what would you cry over? And when you're standing there staring at this hall closet and it's full of crap and you realize I couldn't even tell you what burned, like (laughs) I'm not crying over any of this. Oh yeah. I've had so many clients who have said, can you just torch my whole basement? Because I, I don't even know what's in there. I don't even really care, but like, yes. <laughs> let's just burn it and start over. <laughs> yes. And so if you're feeling that way, like I, yeah. one thing that I use too is a purgatory. <clears throat> um, so I say like, okay, great. If you feel that way, um, like for example, in closets, I find that helpful. Like a lot of, I know you have like a closet class and I have a minimalist wardrobe class too. And I bet there's so okay. much overlap, which I love. Uh, but yeah. I have like a purgatory. So I, at, when we go through and we do that edit, I suggest people be like totally liberal with it because we're not getting rid of it. We're just going to put it all in this one box and we're going to tape it shut and it's going to be in purgatory for, and we discuss like what amount of time <laughs> would feel good for them. And of course they never open the box. Yeah. Like they yeah. never break the seal. Like it, And then after however much time they have decided, whatever number they have determined, um, then it's really easy for them to just donate it. Totally. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, yeah, I love all of those exercises and hacks that just help you clarify further, mm-hmm. like what you care about, what your values are, what's really important. Cause it really boils down to typically like it's people and experiences. It's yep. there's, it's not like you're treasuring the mugs in your house or the furniture, you know, Yes, but we put so much mental energy into them. It's really interesting. Oh, that's so true. (laughs) Like, so let's talk about this focus piece a little bit. All of my Ah. coaching clients come to me feeling overwhelmed. And one of the first things we do is make a list of their challenges and rank them in order of importance. And then Mm -hmm. we focus all of our energy on one challenge at a time. When you focus on everything, you make progress on nothing. I like really hope people are hearing that. (laughs) You dilute your power to affect any meaningful change. So if you run around every day trying to declutter and clean up your whole house, you will make no meaningful progress, become paralyzed and overwhelmed, feel defeated and quit. If you focus all of your energy on one drawer, in 15 minutes you will have a tangible win. Then you focus on a cabinet, in a closet, your power and your effectiveness reverberate throughout your life. Or if you prefer ancient proverb form, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Take small bites, my friends. Yes, so well said. 
It's funny because I posted a while back on Instagram about my 15 minute cleaning boundary, which I'll talk more about in a future episode about daily routines. But when I saw your 15 minute win challenge, I thought, damn girl, you just expanded that concept in a way that is so much more fun and marketable. Yay. <laughs> yeah. So it's totally taken off and it, it comes from like exactly what you just said so eloquently, which is like, if you try to do everything, you end up doing nothing. Mm -hmm. And I think most of us have huge mental blocks about just getting out of overwhelm and into action when everything feels like too much and it's all swirling around in our brains. Mm -hmm. So I started doing this 15 minute win hack with myself um, with like really funny things like just like, I don't want to go to Ikea to return, you know, whatever it was, but I have to let me see if I can get in and out of Ikea in 15 minutes or less. I actually did this this morning before getting on this call <laughs> in and out of Ikea in under 15 minutes. And I felt so victorious and it's kind of like gamifying, you know, those dreaded tasks, yes. errands. Um, and so I founded this hashtag on Instagram, 15 min win, and people have been doing it all over the world and sharing their little victories. And what I love about it is I've been getting these messages saying, you know, the 15 minute win concept got me out of my brain and out of overwhelm because anyone can do anything for 15 minutes. Yep. Once you start, you typically just be, you get that momentum mm -hmm. and you kind of get that compound effect of even doing multiple 15 minute wins. You can benefit hugely from a series of small, smart, incremental choices. Um, and so I'm all about like taking a huge project and breaking it down into 15 minute wins where you do one drawer at a time. Like you don't have to take on an entire mountain of a room. Mm -hmm. You can just do it 15 minutes at a time. And so I think it makes it much more manageable for people's brains to feel like, okay, well I have 15 minutes, like yeah. surely I can do that. And then they complete something instead of starting a monstrous thing and feeling like they're never getting ahead. Exactly, exactly. And it like you can it just shifts the whole direction um, of things and it, it starts that inertia. And then once that inertia is going, like it tends to carry through, like it tends to keep going. You get this you take this bite that you can actually chew and actually digest yeah. <laughs> and like you feel amazing and you're really harnessing your focus. And so 15 minutes of focused work is, is so much more effective than four hours of unfocused work. Right. Totally. I mean, how many times have you spent a whole day, like just walking around saying, I have so much to do all day yes. and doing nothing. <laughs> And you like move I, things I'm around. Guilty. Yes. yes. I am guilty as charged on that one. And then I'm like, Shira, just <laughs> pick something and do it. <laughs> yes. Yes. I can fall into that with work too. Like if I feel yeah. like I have so many projects and I'm kind of just bouncing around between them, I make no progress on anything. And I feel really lousy and I didn't produce any like really quality work. It's only when I clear all of the clutter out of the way and just focus on one thing and one thing right. only that I right. actually like produce meaningful work and it feels amazing. <laughs> totally. I mean, it's funny. I just started this new program, Get Organized Masterclass. And the very first thing I have people do is very similar to the exercise you just described of doing a home audit where you write down every single thing in your house that needs work every project and then you pick one. Yes. So it's like, yes. it gives your brain a chance to kind of like air all of its grievances. <laughs> yes. Like, and then there's this thing and then there's that thing. And then I'll say to my clients, like anything else, anything else until they really can't think of anything else. And sometimes just the process of downloading all of that you feel better even without taking action yet. Yes, because you're taking mental clutter from this like nebulous realm where you can't actually hold it or understand it or see it for what it is. And you're putting it on the paper. You're bringing it into the like real concrete practical world. And I, I hope people are 
really taking note of this exercise and understanding that you can apply it to so many things. Like the example I used earlier was that I do this with parenting. Like if you are feeling completely overwhelmed in your relationship with one of your children and it just feels like it's all bad and it's all so heavy and it's all so hard, like make a list of every single difficulty that that you have that your child has that you guys have together like m- make a list actually write it all down and what you're going to find is a it's actually not as much as you thought like right. it might feel like a hundred things but all of the, like 50 of those things are actually just one thing exactly. it's like just one thing that's that's <laughs> expressing itself in a in a in a bunch of different settings but it's actually just one problem like so this thing that felt massive and immense and like numerous all of a sudden you realize, oh, that's, this is actually just like three things. And we're just going to work on one at a time. Right. And I feel like on those days where I'm walking around, you know, with all the things swirling around in my brain, thinking I have so much to do, I have so much to do. If I sit down and just write down all the things, sometimes I look at it and I'm like, oh, it's four things. (laughs) (laughs) I have four things to do. I think I can handle it. So true. Okay, I want to speak to something that I've experienced personally and with my clients as being a powerful shift. When we set ourselves to the task of decluttering and organizing, we often focus on making the decisions of what to get rid of. But I actually advocate for, after selecting an area of focus, starting by making a list of what you need and want to have in that space. And Mm -hmm. I'm going to walk you through a couple of exercises that can help you through that. The ones, those questions that I mentioned earlier. Um, and Shira, if this is not your jam, feel free to do whatever the podcast equivalent of nodding and smiling is for a hot minute here. And then I'll invite you to jump in. I'm with you. (laughs) So just that, those questions I talked about earlier, if all of your belongings were washed away in a flood, what would you be devastated to have lost, need to replace, want to buy? And this simple exercise provides a lot of clarity. Um, for example, let's say we're talking about the office. Um, there's nothing in the office that I would be devastated to have lost. What would I need to replace? Like I would have to replace like passports, birth certificates, you know, things like that. What would I want to replace? Well, I would want to replace like my podcast microphone because <laughs> I really enjoy this work. I find it meaningful. So just moving through those questions. Um, and then I'm going to list those out. So I would want to buy um, a new podcast mic. I would write that on the list. Um, and then we it's like we have a shopping list and we're simply shopping our own home. Um, mm-hmm. It's holding space for those values-based wants. And then you can more easily toss or donate whatever is not on the list. So the second list-making tool um, that I use is to walk through the routines that happen in that space. For example, you get up and you go into the bathroom and you pee. Okay, you need toilet paper. What's next? (laughs) Next, you wash your hands with soap. Okay, you need one hand soap. Cool, let's write that on the list. Toilet paper, one hand soap. Then you dry your hands on a towel. Okay, you need one towel. And again, once you have your list, it's easier to let go of everything that's just not on the list than it is to agonize over rejecting each and every object. It's kind of like flipping a negative into a positive. Who gets invited as opposed to who gets evicted? It's subtle, but for a lot of people, that distinction can be really meaningful. Are you a Uh, list maker, Shira? I am such a list maker. I love the list. And I love that exercise. <laughs> I, I love what you just said. And I think, you know, what I've noticed sometimes when um, people start with the editing and the what do I need to get rid of, they can get really overwhelmed. And, and defensive. So I, I do kind of a similar thing where I flip it and I'm like, well, what are the things in this room that you love and you use? Like, let's pick mm-hmm. all your favorites first. And then once we have those clarified, then it's much easier to look at the rest of it and be like, oh, well, I already have this and this is a better version of that. Um, So anyway, I love the exercise you just did for that reason because it's focusing on the things that you want to keep Mm -hmm. um, and the things that make sense for your life and your lifestyle. Um, In terms of lists, I am like a queen bee list maker. (laughs) Love making lists. Um, I love checking off lists. I love everything about it. Um, <laughs> Me too. I also like taking a list and putting all of my action items into my calendar and then getting rid of the list. Mm-hmm. 
So that's something that I realized um, one of my teachers has this kind of mantra, like throw out your to-do list. And her whole thing is about like, instead of having all the scraps of paper all over your house, you organize that list, you figure out exactly what your action items are, you schedule them, and then you don't need the physical list anymore. You just Mm -hmm. your calendar. Um, But yeah, I think for me, making lists is very therapeutic. Like it's a way of getting all of that mental clutter out of my brain and onto paper um, and then organizing it. So it's sort of like the big dump followed by the, you know, what can I let go of? What can I delegate? And then what are the real priorities? And then scheduling those priorities. Yes, I love all that. And I completely agree. Um, And the list making thing, like those two exercises that I described, the um, the natural disaster one, I don't recommend walking through with younger kids because <laughs> imaginative play is reality yeah. for them. But the second one, the walking through the routine, that one is actually super helpful with kids. So like mm-hmm. if you're, if you notice that your child is overwhelmed in their space and it's not working really well for them and you're hoping to help them to simplify things, um, walking through the routine with them like let's pretend we're going through a whole day like in your space so you're laying in your bed and you wake up like what's the first thing that you feel or that you hear or that you need uh well like I feel my soft blanket on me it feels so soft and I feel so cozy and I love it like okay awesome like so the blanket's definitely gonna stay like that's something that adds value to your life and adds to this space for you and how it feels good what's next like what's the next thing you do like, okay, well, I, I swing my feet on my bed and I stand up on my rug and it's nice because like the wood floor is cold and the rug feels good. And like, okay, great. Like, so the rug definitely is going to stay. You know, you kind of like walk through what you do in the space. Then I go to get dressed and it's really hard for me to get dressed because I can't find the clothes I'm looking for. Like, okay, so there's an area like where you would simplify and then you start moving through that process. Um, but go, just going through that exercise of walking through a day in a space Um, And then just making a list of those things. And again, like that's your shopping list and you're just shopping your own home. Um, I just find it so helpful and especially with kids too. Yeah. And it's probably such a tiny percentage of the items that people actually own. For sure. I mean, you get through that list and there are like 10 things on it. Right. And then there are like 5,000 things in that room. <laughs> cool. <laughs> like just pull the keepers and then box up the rest yeah. and get rid of them. If something feels too hard to get rid of, put it in purgatory and write an expiration date on it. And if that date comes and you haven't, you needed to break the seal, then let it, then you're ready to let it go. Right. Yeah. Love it. Okay. So we've worked through some blocks, chosen an area of focus, made a list, and now it's time to get our hands dirty. Gather everything together for the area of focus, quick toss anything expired, broken, or used up, and then shop your own stash, pulling from what you have to fill the seats on your list, organize keepers into categories, create a space for each one, donate, relocate, or throw away anything left, and then shop outside your home for remaining needs. And like Shira said earlier, that's the last step. (laughs) So that's how I roll. But Shira, I'm sure your process is different, and I want to hear all about it. Yeah, well, I mean, it it is and it isn't. You know, I think the foundation is the same. Um, My five steps are basically like, number one, clarify. So that's both clarifying your own values and your goals and what you're trying to make space for in your life and home. Um, Then my second step is editing. So it's clearing away the clutter that doesn't elevate and improve and support your life. Um, Then after that, it's organizing. Um, And so I teach people kind of how simple organizing can be, that it's basically putting similar things together and giving everything a designated home. Mm -hmm. Um, So we create homes for all of the keepers and then um, elevate. So, you know, I mentioned I've always really loved style and design and aesthetics. So I love looking around your home and thinking like, how can you elevate those simple everyday utilitarian items? So I have lots of fun elevating like everything from like your kitchen sponge (laughs) to your hand soap to the trash can in your bathroom. 
Um, so I really feel like, especially for those everyday utilitarian things that people typically dismiss, like who cares, Yeah. you know, I'll get it from the drugstore. To me, those are the things you really want to look at with fresh eyes and think about how much you're actually, um, interacting with them Yes. and how lovely it would be to make them nice to look at as well as functional. Um, and then the last piece in my process is maintenance. So that's looking at what are the simple habit shifts that you can, um, practice to keep your space looking sharp now that it's edited and organized and elevated. So, Oh, that's beautiful. I love all of those steps. And I love your piece too, about elevating some of those everyday items. I, Often, like if I'm just standing in a space, I won't think about that. But when I walk through like that natural disaster exercise and I get to like, what would you buy? It's interesting because like if all of these burned in a fire or washed away in a flood, um, like if I wouldn't replace it with the same thing, like that's, that's illuminating for me. It's like, oh, well, okay. So if all of the like plastic flossers were just that we bought from Costco were just gone. <laughs> like what would I, what would I replace it with? Like, what would I want to buy instead? Like, okay, well, and then I can look into the alternatives. Like what would be more eco-friendly? What is like more effective for your teeth? What would be easier for the kids to use? Like, so a lot of times we just, we just sort of have these things that we're doing cause we've been doing them for a long time, like buying that drugstore sponge. But if really the slate was wiped clean, like how yeah. could you elevate it? Yeah, I love that. Totally. Word. It's like similar to that. Like if you were moving, like yes. what would you take? How would you start over? What would you do differently? And I always have things like that. Like I'm always trying to kind of improve and elevate things in my home. And my rule is I have to use up what I have yep. first before yep. I treat myself to the new things, Same whether thing. it's like a face wash or a hand soap or a mascara mm-hmm. or a coffee table book. It's like, this has to be totally used and done. And then I'll treat myself to a new one. I do the same thing. I love that. (laughs) Like in addition to minimalism, there's another rare in the organizing space value that we share. And that is a mindfulness around low or zero waste living. There are so many organizer accounts on Instagram that I want to love, but I feel like I'm killing a polar bear just looking at the pictures (laughs) of kitchen cabinets filled with 500 clear plastic bins, filled with a thousand clear plastic bottles, filled with expensive disposable chemicals. And to be clear, my home is not plastic free. Like I feel no judgment towards the existence of plastic or chemicals in anyone's home. If you've listened to the food episode of this podcast, you know that I feel no shame about my love for bags of simply white cheddar Cheeto puffs. And there are (laughs) some organizing situations for which a plastic bin is just the only thing that will do the job well, like sentimental or keepsake boxes. Each member of our family has one and there just isn't anything that does the job as well as a large clear plastic bin. Like it protects it from moisture, it protects it from pests, protects it like in a way that other things just, just wouldn't. Yeah. Um, And there are some, it just, it doesn't feel like I'm making the world a better place through my work. If I'm telling people that putting everything in clear plastic bins is the only definition or expression of the word organized. So I try to offer low zero waste, natural reusable ideas that are better for people's health wallets and the planet in addition to functioning and looking so much better. Um, Like glass jars are my best friends, menstrual cups in the bathroom, cloth napkins and towels in the kitchen, homemade cleaners, natural fiber bins. I wish I could throw decanting parties. I love it so much. (laughs) Oh my God, you totally should. I'd be first in line. (laughs) I will even help my clients locate the nearest bulk bin grocery store and join their local buy nothing group. Love that sharing economy. Um, But I totally love that point you made because I did the same thing. Like when I switched over from all the um, chemical cleaners, you know, uh, that we had like all the plastic bottles filled with all the crap, which are like, they're expensive. They're not healthy. They're not good for the planet. We, I like, we used up everything that we had first. And then when I would have gone out and replaced it, I just bought like glass jars, glass spray bottles instead, and then looked up recipes for like homemade cleaners. Um, right. and oh my God, they work so much better and they look beautiful. Like you said, elevated. It feels like cleaning elevated every time I wipe down a counter with this like beautiful microfiber cloth that's reusable (laughs) and this glass bottle with this homemade cleaner. It feels so good. So share with us some of your low zero waste organizing tips. 
Yeah. So, I mean, I think like you, um, I do my very best not to buy plastic. Um, there are certain places like you mentioned with like a weatherproof bin for your sentimental stuff where there really isn't a good alternative. I've done the research and sadly, you know, found there are certain things where plastic really is the best, but the good news is like, if you have just the volume that you need and you have stuff in it, that's going to be stored for a lifetime, you never have to replace that plastic. So it's like a one and done investment. Um, you know, my number one advice is just about changing your consumption habits. Um, so it's kind of like what's done is done. You've bought what you've bought, but let's look at moving forward. How can you be the gatekeeper of your home and really make more thoughtful choices about what you bring into your home? Mm-hmm. And when you're editing, um, how can you be really thoughtful about how you get rid of things? So, you know, I kind of wince when I see some of these, you know, makeover shows on TV and everything's just going into the dumpster. (laughs) Um, I think the landfill is really the last resort and there's so many things you can do prior to that. Um, so I always look at first, is this something that could be repaired, um, that you may want to keep and still use? If not, is it something you can donate? Um, if not, is it something you can recycle and kind of going all the way down the chain until like really no, it is just landfill. And that's such a tiny percentage. Um, so and once you start walking through that thought process on the letting go in, you start walking through that process on the buying end too. Exactly. Because then you kind of realize what a drag it is, yes. right? Like I spend my weekend sometimes driving to like an e-waste center or a recycling center or bringing my extra paint that we bought to hazardous waste. Next time I'm going to buy less paint, you mm-hmm, know, mm-hmm. <laughs> cause I don't want the hassle of disposing of it. Um, so those are kind of like the big broad ones, but I think there are some like really easy sustainable swaps that people can practice that are so painless. So like one of them is just with your paper goods, like, you know, if you're a big paper towel user considering just using like, you know, a cloth or microfiber rag instead, um, with toilet paper, there's this great brand from Australia, but they ship everywhere called who gives a crap. (laughs) Um, and they are recycled toilet paper with no plastic in their packaging. Um, so that's one of the hugest sources of plastic waste is just everybody buys toilet paper and almost all toilet paper is covered in plastic. Yeah. Um, so like little simple shifts like that. Um, we recently shifted from using a sponge, um, to one of those like lovely, um, natural brushes, um, that I actually enjoy much more than a sponge cause it's on a handle. So you're not like touching mm-hmm. a sponge and <laughs> gross food and all the things. And it looks lovely. I have it in a like ceramic cup by my, um, sink. So like little swaps like that, that you can do, like looking at swapping your paper towels for a rag, swapping your toilet paper for more eco-friendly toilet paper. Um, your sponge, like I mentioned, um, Oh, another one is, um, dryer sheets are a huge, Mm. um, so we swapped with like, wool the wool ball, yeah. like wool balls and you can put essential oils if you want it to smell. If not, like we just leave ours, but they do, they get the job done and you don't have to buy anything ever again. Like we've had ours for years. And, um, so like those little things make such a big difference. And I think sometimes it's easy to think like, I'm just one person. What can I do? It's so overwhelming. But I think those little tiny swaps, Um, Another great one is, you know, a reusable water bottle, like really banishing the single use plastics. Um, I have a great water bottle I carry with me everywhere. Um, And so I've just stopped consuming, you know, the plastic. Um, We've also tried to get all of the Ziploc bags, which is hard out of our house. We now use the, um, what are they called? The The stashers. Yeah. Yeah. So we have like five stasher bags and we don't buy Ziploc anymore. So everyone has kind of their comfort zone with what they feel comfortable swapping. And sometimes it's just baby steps. But I think even if you just pick one thing that you say, all right, we're going to just 
stop buying, you know, um, say toilet paper in plastic and we're going to order these who gives a crap. Like that's mm -hmm. one thing that cumulatively, like over a lifetime makes a huge difference to the planet. Oh, I completely, completely agree. I think that, that the environmental issue is one that just like we were talking about with the clutter and with other things, it's so easy to feel overwhelmed with, but like setting up the 15 minute win to declutter an area, I have set up a time boundary of once a month. So once a month, I try and swap something out for a zero waste option just once Love a it. month. Like, and that yeah. feels totally doable for me because once a month, something runs out or gets worn yes. out, you know, yeah. like, and when, yeah. and when that, when it happens for just the one thing, I research like more eco-friendly alternatives and I invest in a more eco-friendly option, like just for just one thing a month. And after having done that for a couple of years, like, I feel like I've made a significant difference and a significant impact. Um, totally. yeah, like the, the cloth in the kitchen, like has been really great. Like it feels elevate, like the style is elevated. The experience of using it feels elevated. And I, it's so, it, it feels like it makes a significant impact because we have six people in our house. We're a family of five and my dad lives in an in-law suite here. And that's a lot of like paper napkins and paper towels. And so we right. have these three drawers like in the edge of our row of cabinets in the kitchen and it's the top one is like the microfiber cleaning cloths the then the cloth napkins and then the hand towels and the hand towels we just bought like inexpensive they were called tea towels from target and we tie-dyed them with our friends like we had like oh, a tie-dye party and we tie-dyed them all and they look so freaking cute in my kitchen and any stains <laughs> or anything just like add to the tie-dye nice. effect like Bonus. they make me smile every time i see them like they're tied to an experience and and like i said i i it would be overwhelming to think about doing that for everything in my house and in my life that's not super eco-friendly but thinking about doing just one a month, like that feels totally doable. Yeah, I love it. I love the idea of just integrating slowly. Mm -hmm. And and I think everything that you do has a compound effect, right? Especially if you have a family and multiple people using these things, yeah. it's going to have a huge effect over years of your life to just make a few simple swaps. Completely agree. Like when I ran out of, we ran out of a seasoning that we use a lot, like cinnamon or something. And so that month I bought um, glass seasoning jars and located like the nearest grocery store that has seasonings in like bulk bins. So I can just refill the jars like mm -hmm. in the bulk bins. Like thinking again, like just, just doing one of those a month, like the, yeah. whatever the first thing that runs out is that month. Um, it has felt totally doable. It's doable on my wallet. And then now that I've been doing it for a while, I feel the financial impact of not using all of these like single use, you know, yeah. pricey things. Like I invest in one thing a month, but then now here on the other end, after I've been doing this for a while, our overhead is so much lower. Yeah, I love that. And we find that especially with the pantry staples, mm -hmm. you know, we've decanted them into the glass jars so we can see what we have at a glance. And so we're no longer rebuying things that we already had buried somewhere because we yes. can just see it. So I think there is, it's like such a win-win because it's uh, beneficial obviously for the planet, but then it makes your life easier and you save money. So it's like, there's no downside. Yes, I completely agree. <laughs> like we bought these like Costco jugs of distilled white vinegar that are useful in, in addition to cooking for like cleaners and um, then I found a local grocery store where I can refill them. So like technically we are just keeping the plastic that we already bought, but rather than like always at the grocery store buying white vinegar or chemical cleaners or whatever, like I just refilled that one, <laughs> that, that well, right. we actually have two, like I, we, we just refill these two plastic jugs when they run out. It's so inexpensive and it yeah. cleans everything so much better and I feel better using it and just win, win, win across the board. The polar bears, I feel like they're thanking me. <laughs> <laughs> they're so happy with you. <laughs> yes, they want to cuddle. Okay, so let's talk about style. This is the last thing I want to cover. Before we get to our Q&A, you have a gorgeous sense of style, and I want you to join me in inviting everyone to turn their homes into their greatest work of art. Style is 
again, it's one of those things that's not always paired with organizing, but I feel like it elevates your whole sense of self when you are nested in a beautiful space. And it doesn't require spending heaps of money on breakable horizontal surface clutter that the kids aren't allowed to touch. I'm talking about open white space and rich textures and a playful moment in a room that catches your eye and makes you smile and yoga mats right there in an earthy basket to support your daily routine and wellness values. Especially in a family integrated home, style can be a powerful sensory experience. And that was a very grandiose buildup to this question, Shira, but I'm passionate <laughs> okay. about this work. What role do you see style playing in the organization process and in people's homes in general? Well, so I think if you um, if you set up a home that feels whatever your version or vision of style or like aesthetically pleasing is, I think it just makes you that much more likely to want to maintain it and treat your space with respect. Um, I think, you know, clutter kind of is a magnet for more clutter. Yeah. And, you know, there have been these like really interesting studies, um, mainly around like littering in big cities, but that when they put like a flower pot out or do things to bring aesthetic beauty to a space, there's less litter, there's less graffiti. And I always find that so fascinating that it's like, if we set up a home that looks really lovely, we're going to treat it better. Like yes. it's just kind of human nature, right? Like if we walk into a staged home, like if we're looking at real estate, we're not going to just like throw our stuff on the floor mm -hmm. because it all looks so lovely. So I always think about kind of curating your home so that it, it puts forth that message of like, this is a space that's been respected, that has had thought and love put into it. Um, and I think that by doing that, by paying attention to, you know, the aesthetics that you love and curating a home that reflects them, you're just much more likely to want to hang up your bag at the end of the day, even when you're tired or mm -hmm. wipe down your kitchen counter, even though you don't feel like it because everything around you kind of, um, I guess puts forth that energy of like respect us. Yes. Um, sounds a little bit woo woo. But I no, it's so it, true. It needed to be true. And like just noticing human behavior that when you walk into a space that feels really beautiful, like even if you think about going into like a curated boutique, if you try something on, you don't just dump it on the floor, you put it back on the hanger, you put it back on the rod where it was hanging, or you try to do your best to neatly fold it. Right. Mm -hmm. So I like setting up your home in the same way and kind of giving it the same respect that you would to another space. Yeah. And while at the same time being completely um, aligned with the people in your house and the lifestyle that you live. For example, my lifestyle contains too much action in nature to be compatible with all of your flowy floral blouses, but goodness, I appreciate <laughs> looking at them in the yeah. same way I appreciate a painting in an art gallery. And in my minimalist wardrobe class, I talk about like your closet being like an art gallery and your clothing being the art. Um, and so, but I just want like people to feel the like accessible part that whatever style like speaks to you, you can, you can execute that style in a way that aligns with the lifestyle you wanna live. Like I said, we have right in the middle of our great room, this coffee table that is the Lego table. And my living room still, like when I look at it or when I walk into it, I can't help but take a deep breath. Like it feels so peaceful and cozy and so much clean open space and it feels so good. And and we have fully accepted that it's it's all going to revolve around this Lego table that's full of Legos. Like so it doesn't <laughs> have to be inaccessible. Right. Another yeah. example, we have um uh, we have this hallway that you can that you sort of look down from the great room and i don't have anything hanging on any of the walls except the very back end of the hallway there's this photo um of a llama it's like a close-up on this llama and it's in this like fancy gold frame um, and every time like i'm walking down that hallway it kind of makes me smirk because it's just like this <laughs> this like funny moment you know Love but but the picture has like a white background like it's really simple and yeah. my husband and my kids and i will like 
put post-it notes on it with like a funny caption of the llama saying something funny or like my husband made like a unicorn horn and wrote like put like a name plaque under it on a post-it that said llama corn and like it's just like you can use style in a way that again like like is aligned with your values and and supports the kind of relationships you want to have and the kind of mood you want to create so style doesn't have to be like a fancy clothing boutique it can it can be whatever resonates with you and still have an elevated sense of style. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, I think my number one tip for elevating your home is less stuff. Yes. <laughs> so it's not about buying anything or pursuing anything other than the pursuit of less noise. Yep. And then I think once you've done that, once you've kind of achieved that edited feel, whatever that is for you, where you feel like everything I own serves me and serves my life. And it's either like, I love looking at it or I use it. Then the kind of next level is like, what are those, um, more personalized touches that will make you feel really good. And maybe it's putting up art that you love or that someone you love made or featuring things from your travels or from your career, or, you know, it's really different for everyone. I don't think there's any like cookie cutter, design solution, but it's Mm -hmm. just about paying attention to what do you love? Like paying attention to what are the colors you love? What are the, do you love prints or patterns or do those give you a headache? Like, do you love cozy textures underfoot or do you just want a hardwood floor? Like kind of being a detective and just paying attention to when you're out and about in the world, what are the things that you notice that bring you joy and how can you start incorporating that in little ways into your own home? Yes. Even like on Instagram or, or Pinterest, like this picture is just really striking me as so beautiful and cozy. And like, what about, what am I seeing visually in this picture that is stirring that feeling in me? Like what is triggering that? And for me, like my style, I I guess for my like interior design style, I would describe it as like earthy minimalist. So like rich, neutral textures, no patterns. Um, and it feels to me like when you simplify the, some of the, like you said, the amount of stuff in the environment, because every single object in a space has an energy. It's, it's making a noise, like you said. Um, so again, with that Lego table example, we don't have any other toys in the living room right now because the Legos are the feature. Right. Like, that's what they're yeah. obsessed with. So there are zero other toys in the living room, none except the Legos. And that just sort of somehow like then balances everything else out and it feels good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's all about, it all goes back to the same thing of like customizing a home that feels good to you. Yeah. So, you know, I work with clients who have every type of style under the sun and people will hire me and say like, I'm not like you. I don't want like a Scandinavian (laughs) home where everything is white. And I'm like, you do you like that. Totally. Nobody needs to do what I'm doing. They just need to feel good. Yes. Completely agree. The show notes can be found at rachelrainbolt.com slash podcast 43, where you can also subscribe and get future show notes sent right to your inbox. Shira, what are your favorite resources for people to dive deeper into this topic? And that includes all of your amazing stuff that we want to send people to. Oh yeah, great. Well, so I have a free five minute makeover series to help people get out of overwhelm and into action. Um, That can be found on my website, which is just my name, shiragill.com. I also have a blog where I give tons of free tips and showcase before afters. And I have a ton of virtual programs. Um, So you can check out basically all of my resources on my website um, or on my Instagram at shiragill. That's where I showcase the 15 minute win challenge. Yes, and make sure you all are following her on Instagram. She's a really fun follow. She posts beautiful pictures, thoughtful captions. I highly recommend it. Well, thank you. <laughs> right, Shira, thank, thank you. So you much. This has been so fun. Yes, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate you giving of your time and your wisdom. Absolutely, my pleasure. 